certainly a lot comes to mind, um, particularly as I stand here in front of the memorial uh, that uh, has been built in, in honor of the work of my father. And this particular weekend, and of course, specifically on tomorrow, as we observe the 57th anniversary, the hope is that the demands that are made by many uh, tomorrow and that are being made throughout our nation are in fact uh, executed in a positive way, when I'm using execution as a positive way. Uh, we are at a critical juncture in our nation and we have a situation where there's tremendous legitimate division. And I say legitimate because um, uh, people believe one thing or another and don't understand that, okay, I don't have to agree with you on everything. There are certainly more moral things that we all should agree on. For example, when we talk about police brutality and misconduct, the whole nation ought to agree that what is going on right now and has been going on for quite some time is wrong. Uh, and that we should immediately change that cultural behavior in police officers. Uh, and this is not to universally in condemn all policemen, but there is a culture in police, some police departments that um, seem to feel they can treat black people anyway and brown people. And uh, people are saying that enough is enough. That's just one issue. It's one very significant issue uh, impacting black and brown communities. But I also think that the, the question of what I hope that happens, we must change what is going on now so that when we do another anniversary, uh, that we will not have to be addressing these issues. We should be far beyond where we are to, today. Um, again, 57 years ago, many of the demands that my father and, and others had are still the same demands today. Uh, the fact that the disparity in amounts of income between black families and white families is so massive uh, in 2020, it just feels like we should be much further along, yeah. and we're not. And so I don't want to have to come to another anniversary again and again and again and still be asking or still be demanding the same kind of things. I, I don't, that's just not acceptable. And I don't believe this generation is going to allow that, quite frankly. Uh, either people are going to change, meaning those who are elected, or they're going to be voted out of office. And I think in November, we're going to see a large number of people who have not been willing to change, and they no longer will be in positions of power. But we'll see a new group of people coming in that are going to say, okay, we're going to take these steps and we're going to take them right now. So when you now, I know this isn't the first anniversary we've done. I know certainly this isn't the first time you've been to this statue. But when you look at that statue today, have your thoughts changed? Does this statue mean something different to you today? I think what this statue and the quotes that are throughout this memorial basically say is the work is nowhere near done and that we come here to derive inspiration because I can assure you that my father and his team encountered all kinds of things during his leadership and no matter what they encountered they kept moving forward they kept forging a strategic plan and you know uh, I think I, I may have said yesterday in our conversations or in the past that one of the things that the black community has to look at, and certainly as a tactic and maybe as a strategy, last year black people in America spent $1.4 trillion. One, not one billion, one trillion dollars. And yet, 
how did the community treat us and those who we support by our dollars? Most would have to say that the treatment was really not the best treatment. I mean, they, they treated us like a customer and a consumer, but the reality is if we just threatened to say we're going to divest from various companies in this country, those companies will come and join us in our struggle and they will ensure that police brutality and misconduct disappears. I know that for a fact. My father in 1955 led the Montgomery bus boycott when Rosa Parks was arrested and for 381 days black people didn't ride those buses. 60% of the ridership was black. So after 381 days there was a serious deficit that the Montgomery bus uh, company had and so they had to do something immediately. My only point is one of the things that in a capitalist society those businesses understand is what and how their money comes to them. And if you don't ask for any accountability, you won't get any accountability. And that's the same thing, that same level of accountability that we ask for there, we really have to implement as it relates to policing all across America. The problem with policing, and this, this is not to indict or, or say that, that many, many policemen every day are protecting and serving and doing an outstanding job. But they are an element in some departments that are, I don't want to call them rogues, I just want to say that they, they don't seem to respect human beings who are black. Not everybody, because they have a different standard. I mean, I, I don't know what people think, but just a day and a half ago, we saw a young man who shot Black Lives Matter protesters. I know one of them that was killed was white. I don't know about the other. But the fact of the matter is, because people were protesting, he felt some may be rioting, and I, I don't know what he was doing. The fact is, he shot someone, and the police, he held his hands up and was walking down the street with his gun, and the people were telling the policeman, he shot people. And they drove right past him. But if that had been a black man, they would have surrounded him, pushed him to the ground, and maybe even killed him. So there's a cultural, there's a mentality that has to be shifted. Because you can't universally, you have to evaluate every situation differently. And so, you know, that, this is the backdrop of, of, of what happened because of Jacob Blake's shooting. Fortunately, he's going to live. But what does that mean when you have to live without a quality of life? Because of someone shooting you seven times in the back, you are paralyzed. Thank God he's going to be able to live. But this behavior has got to stop. And then the other side of the coin is if people are going to condemn violence, and I do think that we have to talk about ways to reform minimizing violence, but if you're going to just criticize those who are violent, how come you're not criticizing those who created the problem? Amen. See, you know, you got to be critical of the police in this context because of what they did. That community was not rioting before they shot this man. Every action creates a reaction. And so there's got to be at least balance. We don't have balance. We have imbalance. And particularly as it relates to the White House, and the Republican leadership in our country, um, and th th not to, um, not, I don't want to denigrate anyone. I don't ever want to, because that's not what my father did. But I certainly want to call out, and hopefully people will hear what is true. The truth is what people need to hear. And so, again, you know, um, when Reverend Sharpton was in Minneapolis, and I was at the service the memorial service for George Floyd. We had talked about calling for this demonstration. Neither of us could have predicted, we probably assumed, but nobody could have predicted that there was gonna be another shooting. And I'm talking about Jacob Blake now. In, within days of the march. 
So there's no question, no one should be asking, well, why are you doing that? I don't think they are. But no one should be asking. People all over this nation and really around the world who've seen what has happened should understand why we are here. So let me ask you this. When this started, it was initially for uh, the wake of George Floyd's death. And now we have uh, Jacob Blake, we have Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, all of these names. There might be an obvious answer to this, but who is this march for? This march is for everyone who has been mistreated. It, it's not a, it's not just one because there are too many even there are many who are named but there are others who unfortunately we don't even know their names because every situation was not captured on video and so yes we are specifically focusing on those names that people know but we're focusing on everyone because this behavior should not be uh, no one should have to go through what these individual families have had to go through losing their loved ones. No one. So when you, you, you bring up a good point that we have cell phones, we have video now, something that wasn't, social media wasn't a thing when your dad was doing his advocacy. So why do you think having that, these moments in the public eye, no matter how distressing they are, no matter how angry it gets people get, right. we need to continue surfacing it? Why do we, I'm sorry. Why we should continue making these part of our headlines and showing, as distressing as these images are, Look, showing that these are happening. Because ultimately, we as a society will address it. Yeah. And if society or the main structures do not themselves address it, we as a community, as I said, we have, we have, opportun we have options. We have never, in all of these years, seen professional athletes deciding we're not going to play. Is this ain't right? That's huge. This is showing the whole nation that, wait a minute, we, we might need to make some changes. It shouldn't be that they might. They should because it's right. But the fact of the matter is, we've never had athletes to do this. So when a number of athletes are standing up, when a number of entertainers are standing up, the, the nation is going to have to address this. And um, there happen to be a couple of ways that it can be addressed at this particular juncture. Because we have an election coming up, and I, I think it is imperative that we elect someone else. Uh, in this case, the selection that exists is Donald Trump and, 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 and Mr. Pence, or Joe Biden and Ms. Harris. Right. I don't think we have a choice. We've got to support Mr. Biden and Ms. Harris because Donald Trump and Mr. Pence are going to do nothing but the same thing they've done for the last three and a half years, which is to divide the nation up. It's almost like cutting it up like a Swiss cheese and making everybody angry at each other. We need a kind of leadership that pushes us to a higher level. We've got a pandemic. We've have 170, over 170,000 people, almost 180, uh, actually moving toward 190, tragically, who've died because of COVID-19. Uh, and the point is that we need everyone to roll up their sleeves and we need to be working together to address this, co this issue, as well as police brutality and misconduct, as well as the fact that the economy is broken and many people don't have jobs so we can't do it divided we can only at least we can begin to do it if we have more unity you, you mentioned the nba you mentioned social media now you bring up another unprecedented event that was not happening in the 60s which is a pandemic and we're still having a major march where thousands of people are expected to show up so why was it important even during a pandemic globally to have this major event to call to action you know it's important this event is so important and so relevant that some people i've heard some and those who choose to come realize that yes there's a pandemic and maybe something might happen but i'd rather be standing up for justice yes, than to be dying meaning and having no meaning it, it means that human lives mean something every human life means something and maybe now i think 
that America understands that black lives do matter. Amen. Maybe policemen, some, don't understand it. Maybe some who are vigilantes don't understand it. Maybe some who are neo-Nazis and skinheads don't understand it. But a whole lot of people, we saw right after George Floyd's tragic death, millions of people, many of them white young people, and white older people, and white children, along with black folk, yes. saying, not just in the United States, in every state in this nation, there was a demonstration. And all over the world, in Europe, and on the African continent, and in Australia, and in South America, and people were saying, Black Lives Matter. Yes. So now, I believe there's a much higher consciousness. And that consciousness is going to cause the transformation to have to come. Absolutely. I mentioned this to you during our first conversation that to me, Martin Luther King Jr. was a name in a history book. It was someone I learned about civil rights from. It was an educator and, and an advocate for social justice. And for many of these people here, it, that's the same thing. But for you, it was dad. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty incredible conversation to be having with yeah. you right now, that the, the meaning Amen. to him and, and you is very different. So if you had an opportunity right now to not speak as a social activist and not to speak as an expert, but as his son, what would you like to say to him if you had that opportunity? Gosh, that's a, that's a profound question. Very pr profound question. The normal question that one would have, and I'm gonna explain this, is, you know, you say, well, Dad, what should we do? I, I don't think that that's not something I need to ask him because I have already stated what we should be doing. And I really believe, just using his example, um, that if we were to decide to divest our resources, you know, if you look at many of the brands that exist today, multi-billion dollar corporations, it is black people who make up the margin of profit. And so until black people consciously understand the power that we have, um, until we exercise and decide, okay, we just, at least for now, we, we gonna, we gonna pull back. We're gonna stop supporting you. Now, when you come to support us, then we will maybe support you. But because you're not supporting us and you're seeing us get maligned uh, like dogs every day. Yes. So I would be asking my father probably a, a different question. And, and I think I, I would ask him something about mobilizing for saving the planet. I mean, our water and our air is getting polluted. You've got a group of people who don't believe that climate change exists. Yes. You've got people who are so, so divided and yet, if you listen to Martin Luther King Jr., he always personified love. Now, he was passionate, but he always personified love. He taught us about forgiveness. And so, the movement of nonviolence, when it is used at its highest level, it is transformative. And so, I, I would want to ask my dad, with the levels of violence that exist today, what can we do, not just to curtail, but what can we do to create what he called was the beloved community? He talked about it. In his last book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? He talked about the last book he wrote, which is ironic and, and, and profound because right now it's prevalent. It feels like chaos everywhere we look. But our objective is community. And that's really, most people want to be treated with dignity and respect. Yes, and when we treat people with dignity and respect, it is returned, even with policing. Mm -hmm. When police treat people with dignity and respect, I mean, you have to, you, you can't just denigrate someone and assume that they're going to respect you. They, generally what happens is people are afraid of a badge, afraid that those who have badges and guns, because we see them using them. Some of them, I'll say, I have to say some, because again, it's not a universal. You have to evaluate every situation on its own merits. But certainly there's a problem, a significant problem, 
as it relates to policing in black and brown communities. We're on the 57th anniversary of this I Have a Dream speech. Did you ever think you would literally be walking in your father's footsteps at this point? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know that I saw it that way. And I'm not even sure that I see it that way today. Let me explain what I mean. If I woke up every morning trying to fulfill the footsteps of my dad, I would fail miserably. <laughs> Most of us won't become Martin Luther King Jr.'s because he was anointed by God. He had a special Amen. calling. Amen. And there may be many, many years before we see another Martin Luther King. That does not mean yes. we yes. cannot achieve the vision that he talked about. Yes. But if I tried to wake up, I mean, my mom used to say, your own father couldn't fulfill his shoes today because his, the, the message, the, the, the way, you know, the way he spoke, it was almost like music. It was, it was symphonic. It was, it was taking words and it, was, it had melodious meanings. And so people, no matter who you were, it's just like an artist can write various types of music and people all over the world can embrace and love it. Well, his speaking was similar. Uh, it, 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 it was almost like writing a major symphony every time or most of the times that he spoke. And all I'm saying is, yeah, anybody can put a speech together, but it's, it's a delivery. It's, it's your believing that this person is speaking as a true representative of God. And I'm not saying that they're not other representatives of God. Don't, don't misinterpret that. I'm just saying that I don't know that we'll see another Martin Luther King Jr., uh, maybe not even in our lifetimes. We will see other leaders. And that's what we really need. We don't need, I don't think we need a Messiah. Not that dad, dad never saw himself that way. But some people probably thought he was a Messiah. And he never, he never embraced that. And I don't think we should be looking for that. I think we should find everything that we need is right within us. You know, I, I think I said yesterday or the day before that, yeah, at like 21 years old, many of these young people are leading these demonstrations and are involved in the demonstrations. At 21 years old, if you go to college and you're in an ROTC, you're a lieutenant in the military when you graduate from college, which means that 20 to 25 officers or, 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 or troops are, you know, you're, you're commanding. So if you can command troops at 21 years old as a lieutenant in the military, why can't you run for school board? Why can't you run for city council? Why can't you run for state legislator or county commissioner? All of these jobs, most of them are part time. And so we need the vision of some of the young people to offer themselves for public office. And I think that's when also we're beginning to see more and more changes come when we have different people elected to office. Because in the United States Congress and the United States Senate, I think the average age is somewhere around, I want to say about 58 the average age of an elected official in Congress, when you can run at a much younger age. So we need more young people in leadership. I think that will help us make significant progress in this nation. I, uh, I know you're a busy guy, so I have one more question. I was gonna ask this yesterday, but I, I thought about it more and I, I realized one saying that's, that's attached to this march is get your knee off my neck, yes. which is very impactful and very bold. Um, and definitely does not tiptoe around anything. It's a very clear message, a very explicit message. Why is it important that we're no longer tiptoeing around these sayings and tiptoeing around these conversations, but having that blunt language all the time? I think, and I hope that if one understand, number one, I think it's important, it's mandatory that people understand uh, what behavior has taken place and that's why the concept of get your knee off my neck is so poignant and appropriate for right now. Yes. Um, I think you have to clearly, for, for the people who, who don't understand, everyone who saw that officer with his knee on the neck of George Floyd yes. and saw that 
man lose his life because of inhumanity of a policeman. Everyone understands that. And that's why this analogy is so clear because in, in, in real time and in real life, quite frankly, there are many ways that people have their foots on the necks of black people and brown people and Native Americans. I mean, we mistreat so many people in this society and we think it's a great society. And that's, you know, I, I didn't, you didn't ask me this, but I, I know many people probably agree with me because we, we don't know when America was great. So I don't understand the notion of great again. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about making America what it ought to be. Right. You see, because in my own personal experience, in my 62 and a half years, I've seen pockets of greatness. I've seen great incidents. But I don't know a period when it was great for everybody. It doesn't exist. But the reality is, if humankind wanted to, we could create that, not just narrative, but that reality so that it could really be great for everyone. Many people came to these shores and have become very successful. Immigrants from all over the world, from the African continent, from South America, from China, uh, even from Russia. And they came and they have developed businesses and they, they made their dreams became true. So I understand again why it was great for individuals, but it has not been great for all and really for the masses of black people, it's been a very challenging set of years. We must change that. We can change that. And during this march, we're gonna have some young people speaking, including my daughter, who is an activist on her own. And I believe her generation will set the tone so that when we come back here, when we come back in 20 years, that this whole nation will be totally different than it is today. Yes, sir. And so let, let me end with these words. My wife uh, actually lends them to me because she's the first one that said them, my wife Andrea. You know, we have to work for change. We have to pray for change. We have to be the change. Amen. And if love has yet not won, then the battle is not yet over. That's right. Yes, yes sir. Yes. Thank you. Amen.